If you will, grab your Bible, turn to the book of Song of Solomon, and uh, we're going to be into chapter 4. We're going to finish chapter 4, maybe get into the first part of chapter 5, and we're, we're just going to keep going with this until we're done. Like I said, we should be done about mid-June, give or take, and then uh, we're going to be taking off the month of July, not just me in this class, but us as a church, we're going to take off the month of July, and then we will kick back in with a new study in August uh, that'll be very interesting. And so, now, uh, we are obviously here studying this thing, A Song of Solomon. We're studying these uh, seven idols, or these seven flashbacks, and so what basically uh, ha has went down so far is we, we opened the book in basically the wedding party. Uh, the, 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 the reception, if you will, and they're telling us, and then they go into telling us how they met. Then they go in and tell us about the espousal period and then what we would know as the eloping, where he comes and gets her and goes and gets married. And we'll go further into these uh, idols tonight. But this is called Public Appearing of the Bridegroom Part 3. Okay, now, uh, we finished... Uh, on verse 5, and I, I will kind of bring you back into speed of this. And so we got to chapter 4, verse 5, and this is, this is Solomon speaking. This is Christ speaking to his church. And we went through all the descriptions about her goat hair and her teeth and all that. And when you put it in proper perspective and you compare scripture with scripture it gives you a beautiful definition of what the church is supposed to look like and we got to chapter uh chapter 4 verse 5 it says and the two breasts are like two young rows that are twins which feed among the lilies and and we said now there was times in history that this book wasn't even being allowed to be read in church let alone systematically taught which i personally think is crazy Genesis to Revelation, there is not one ounce of God's Word that is inappropriate. So for us to think, well, we shouldn't teach that. Well, if we shouldn't, then God wouldn't have put it in there. Okay, But when you break these verses down, and this being one of the prime examples, is this is probably the first verse that's like, whoa, that's a, that's a little much. What, what, what do we do with all that? Well, we got in and we realized that the imagery here is a woman that is at full maturity, ready to bear children. Uh, the analogy of them being like two rows or deer feeding gives the idea that they are not in the early stages of development, but they are full enough to lean downward. Historically, breasts were the basic sign to others that a woman was ready for marriage. And guys, this is not, that's not deep. Now, it, <laughs> When in my grandmother's day, 13 year old women would marry 20 something year old men, which, uh, yeah, that too. I, I, I wasn't going there, but yes, uh, that is a special case for sure. But for me, when my daughters were 13, if some 25 year old dude walked up, I'd have dropped them like a bad habit. Like something's wrong with you. But obviously, in different cultures and lifestyles and remember there was a lot of arranged marriages and so the development and purity and so forth but remember we are talking about christ and his church okay now hang with me all right so the breasts were created for twofold reason obviously reproductive tools for nursing right and then obviously sexual attraction with the husband intimacy compared to the face and arms in other words the reason why we go so dogmatic about hey let's be modest let's cover ourselves the reason being is because god so designed the male to be attracted physically to these areas and 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 when you say okay what does this got to do with the church and Christ, okay? The idea is that when the church and Christ are intimate, then there'll be reproduction going on, that people will be getting saved. And then once a person gets saved, the church as the bride has a duty to nourish or uh, uh, nurse that newborn and get them into a place where they can feed themselves. That's what, obviously, breastfeeding is about. So, when you break these verses down, you know, hey man, this is not real 
you know, erotic, pornographic. It's pretty much letting you know the position of the church in Christ. Our job is to be intimate with our husband. And when we produce fruit from that intimacy, our job isn't done. Our job then is to nurture that newborn into that place. And so that's basically what we're talking about. Now, we got into verse, we didn't get to verse 6, and I left this off last week because we ran out of time, but let's just break it down before we go further. Now notice, until the daybreak, now this is still the Lord speaking to the church, until the daybreak, now what do we call the daybreak? We call it the morning, right? Malachi 4 says that one day, that the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness is going to rise, okay? And when he does, we're talking about the second coming of the Lord, right? Okay, now that we all got that down, until the day of the Lord, if you will, and the shadows flee away. Well, when do the shadows go away? At high noon, okay? Once the shadows go away, I will get me to the mountain. And he says, until that day... I will get me to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. Okay, now, what has Jesus for the last 2,000 years been doing? He's waiting on the day, the day of the Lord. But in that time for the last 2,000 years, what has been the message? There you go. The gospel. Death, burial, and resurrection. He says, until the daybreak, until the second coming, I, meaning the Lord, will get me to the mountain of myrrh. Myrrh is the death. That's the picture of the death. And, and watch this. What does his job right now during the church age? To be an intermediator, to be a propitiation, to be the mediator between God and man. Now, when you understand what frankincense is about, it's all about that priesthood. And so what is Jesus now? The great high priest. And what do we do? We go to Jesus, and Jesus is our representation before God. Now to understand the difference between a priest and a prophet, is a prophet goes to the people on behalf of God. A priest goes to God on behalf of the people. And for the last 2,000 years... Until the day of the Lord, what Jesus is going to do is the gospel message and be an intermediator. That's, that's the whole purpose of him being. Now notice this. Thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. Now who is he talking to? The Shulamite, right? Who is a picture of? The church. And here's what he says. Now when you look at the church, what do you see? It's a mess. You know, I gave the analogy of the ugly bride last week, and everybody got quiet in here when I said, you ever been to a wedding, you see the bride, and she's really ugly? And everybody's like, oh, I've seen it once, but I didn't want to admit to it. All right? And what I was trying to show you is, we're the ugly bride. There's, there's not a lot about us beautiful. I mean, we are just sinners, saved by the grace of God, placed in the bride of Christ in the body of Christ and they, here we are and yet when whoever that guy is marrying the ugly bride you know what he sees beauty okay now, now check this out thou the bride you're fair my love there's no spot in thee you think maybe that the Bible was written by the same guy now look at this verse Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Isn't it interesting, all the way over here in the book of Song of Solomon, years, thousands of years before Paul wrote that, here's, here's Solomon, a picture of, of, of Jesus Christ, looking at his bride and saying, I don't see a spot in you. And one day when we stand there at the marriage supper of the Lamb, we will actually stand spotless before him without one blemish about us. Now, hang with me, all right? So now we get into verse 8. You're going to have to think a little on this because I want you to see some cool stuff. 
A couple weeks back, we mentioned Lebanon. And I said, I I'm not going to go into depth on that because I'm going to explain how Lebanon is a picture of the third heaven. And, and this is the verse that we're going to bring out. And I want you to notice here. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse, with me from Lebanon. Look from the top of Amana, from the top of Shinar and Hermon, from the lion's den from the mountains of the leopards. Okay, now there's a lot going on here, but we're going to break this down. Now, I want you to notice that the verse doesn't say, come with me to Lebanon. He's asking his bride to come with him from Lebanon. Now, we got that, right? Because if, you, if you're missing that, you're, it, this is all going to be just a moot point. Now, hang on. Now, when we understand what Lebanon is in the Bible, number, number one, the word Lebanon means whiteness or the white place. Now, for those of you that don't understand why that is, uh, I, I love to snow ski, and, and, and CJ's picked it up now, and we're going to probably be doing some other different places. And, and one of the places I've always wanted to snow ski, because you can't do it in Israel, but just north of Israel is Lebanon. And man, you can actually be standing at the Mediterranean and look up and see the snow-capped mountains. And so Lebanon would have been a much higher elevation than Israel. And they have all these snow areas here. And Lebanon is this high place. Now, I want you to notice, so it's a white place. Now, what is white a picture of in the Bible? Purity, right? Okay, righteousness and purity. Lebanon is north of Israel. It's in the north place. Now, where is heaven from here? North. Always in the Bible. Every time you find out where heaven is, it is in a geographical location, and it's always north. Okay? Now, the other thing, it's a high place. Or uh, high places, if you will. That's what Lebanon represents. Hang with me. Then we have Amana, which means a fixed or settled place, especially connected to the covenant or truth. Now, the Word of God is forever settled, where? In heaven. Okay? Lebanon's a pure place, white, it's north, it is uh, a high place. Amana is a fixed or settled place, especially connected to the covenant and truth. Then, Hermon means a devoted or sacred place. Right? Now, if you didn't know any better, you would think I just described to you the third heaven. Now, hang with me. Now watch. So this is, the, this is, is Mount Hermon. These are some pictures I got off the internet. I, I could have gave you uh, the ones that I, I was there in 2017 with, with Mark and a bunch of Living Faith people, and we, we had a great time. We went up Mount Hermon, and it was just cool, man. You get up there, and you can see Damascus, or not, I don't know if it's Damascus. You can see over into Syria from there, and you see Lebanon, and there's a UN station up there. I'll tell you about that. Uh, when you study Genesis 6, you come to find out that the 200 watcher angels that came down in Genesis 6 landed on Mount Hermon. Uh, I mean, that place is unique. But here it is, and, and this is kind of where it's at. Now, I want you to notice, when you stare at a map, now I've done this for 20 years as a pastor, showed you that even the maps preach. I mean, I, I, listen, I, I, before I go into this, you understand, here's Mount Hermon, Mount Amana is right here. Now, what happens is, is this snow-capped mountains melt in the, in the summertime and they give this water of life and it comes down into the Sea of Galilee and the Sea of Galilee is full of life and it releases its water into the Jordan River and it goes down into the Dead Sea and the Dead Sea is absolutely dead because it has no outlet. I just taught you through the maps what goes on in every Baptist church. Those of you that sit in here week after week after week and keep learning and keep learning and don't do nothing with it, you're just like the Dead Sea. There's no outlet. 
But those that take in the information that we're trying to get you, and you use that information and put it back out there for somebody else, you're full of life. You're like the Sea of Galilee. And I just showed you, that's just a map. But God's just, do you think Romans 1.20 doesn't apply to geography? Like God's screaming truth in every aspect. Now I want you to notice here. Let's get back on point. I, that, that one I just showed you was a freebie. All right, now. Let it reflect in my paycheck. All right, now. <laughs> Mount Amana is up here. Remember what Amana is. Okay? Now, Mount Hermon's right here. This is all Lebanon up in here. Here is the Sea of Galilee. Here is Jerusalem. Down here, Isaiah 34 says this is where the lake of fire is. Okay? Up here, we have a white, pure, high place. And Amana and Hermon. Hermon is a sacred place. Amana is a... Why did I go blank on Amana? All right, there we go. A fixed or a settled place. Now, so all that's here. Then there is a body of water. Then there is where Jerusalem and the people live. There is another body of water. And then Isaiah 34 says, Ida Meda, right down here at the bottom of the Dead Sea, is where a, sea, or, or a lake of fire is going to be. Just a side note, there are two lake of fires. There's a lake of fire, and there is the lake of fire. One is on this planet. The other one is in eternity when we have a new heaven and a new earth. And that's a whole different study. So, now... This is a, pro, uh, a, 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 a pictorial that I put together years ago about the layout of the universe that we understand. Now, I obviously have told people I would make major changes to this, not necessarily so much here or so much in here, but right in this general area, I have a huge disagreement with, okay? As we learn and as we go through and understand certain things, I think we lied a lot about this area. But either way, the layout's still the same. Now hang with me. What do you have up here? You have a holy place. A place that is settled. A place that is sacred. And below that is a body of water. Below that is where we live. Below that is a body of water. Below that is the lake of fire. You keep wanting to say see a glass, but that's not true. That's up here, all right? Now, notice, holy place, body of water, where we live, body of water, lake of fire. Now, you think that's, that's just some cool little thing I came up with? No. God lays out everything in His book perfect. Everything. You can't even make it up. Like, it, it, all the greatest minds on the planet could get together and can't even begin to put this book together the way it is. It's so perfect. If I had no other evidence of God other than the perfection of this book, it would be enough for me. I mean, it's just unbelievable how well it goes. Now watch this. We're not done with that little thing. Remember, he says, come with me from Lebanon. When you and I return with Jesus Christ and we are married to Him, where are we coming from? Heaven. Now all you that are Calvinists or replacement theologists, all you that think we're going through the tribulation, good luck with coming back with Him from heaven. Because in order for you to come back from heaven with Him, you've got to get raptured out of here. Alright, now... So hang with me. Come from, oh, come with me from Lebanon, my spouse, and from Lebanon, from Amana to Hermon, all right, from the lion's den, from the mountains of the leopards. There's something up there where we have these wild beasts that are roaming. Watch this. White, holy, pure. Body of water. Second heaven, first heaven, body of water, lake of fire. Do you know that the second heavens inhabit all kinds of beings? That it's, it's interesting, he refers to one of them as a lion. 
Now, remind me who our enemy is. A roaring lion, right? Now, remind me what that beast is described as in Revelation 13. That's a leper, right? You think maybe God's trying to show you, hey, up here in this second heaven are some entities that you and I have to deal with. You know what, you know what we call those places? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, where? In high places. I'm telling you, the topography of the land screams the truth of God's Word. You can't even get around it. All right, now hang with me. All right, so let's get to verse 9. Thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. Thou hast ravished my heart. He says it twice. And remember, that's our, our big cue to say, hey, listen up. Now, it's interesting that Solomon is so over, head over heels in love with her, his heart is ravished. Now, I want you to pay attention. Do you remember back in chapter 1, verse 6? We found out that this woman, who's a picture of the church, had lost her position and had been punished to go work the vineyards. Remember this? My mother's mad at me. Or my mother's children are angry with me. They made me, me the keeper of the vineyards. So she had obviously done something wrong, right? Would you agree the church was in the... Before we got saved, every one of us were guilty of doing something wrong. Watch. How many of you gentlemen here would raise your hand and admit that your wife's got some flaws? You pansies. There we go. Thank God. One. Thank you, Rodney. All right. Now. <laughs> Now, now, now check this out. Was the Shudamite lady flawed? Absolutely. But when he thinks of her, he doesn't even bring any of this up. He is so smitten with her, he loves her despite her flaws. Which is how most men, you didn't want to raise your hand because you were scared, but most men would admit, yeah, my wife's got some flaws, but I love her anyway. By the way, you can, you can flip the gender on that. Like, it, it, it works both ways. But when you're in love, love hides a multitude of sin. Like, you look past stuff. Like, I, I can do it with my kids. Listen, your kids irritate the dog water out of me. Now, don't get too excited. I can barely stand my own three. But, <laughs> but the bottom line is, I'm going to overlook some things because I love them. Okay? Same way in this situation, Jesus looks at his bride and he says, Man, I'm ravished by you. I am, and, and yet, Baptists want to live their life, and most of this is because of the pulpits, convinced that he's always mad at us. Like, listen, it, I... The independent fundies want to get into church every week, sing sad songs, make you feel bad, drive you to an altar, which, fine, all that, there's a time and place for all that. But will you come to the place in your life that you can accept there's nothing you can do to get Jesus to love you more? And there's nothing you could do to get Jesus to love you less. And once you find that position, you finally go, and you relax. That's what true marriage is. Is when you find out, well, well if I burn his supper, he won't love me. No, he's going to love you anyway. Now, he's going to complain about the supper, but he, he's going to love you anyway. Now, all right, now watch this. Okay, so he says, Thou hast ravaged my heart, my sister, my spouse. And then he goes on again in verse 10, my sister, my spouse. Now, it almost sounds like an Alabama novel here at this point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
That, that's the flaws that Rodney was talking about. All right? Now, in true biblical marriage, this is a perfect picture. Because that's my spouse. But because we both know Jesus Christ is our Savior, that's my sister in Christ. That's actually what God intended for every model of marriage. Listen, as a pastor, if you come to me and say, I want to get married and I'm going to marry this person, will you marry us? The first thing we're going to start with is, I want to know your salvation experience. Because if one of you is saved and the other one isn't, I don't want to marry you. Because it's not a biblical marriage. I'd rather marry two lost people than to marry an unequally yoked couple. And, and, the, and the reason being is, man, we're supposed to be a picture of the gospel. And if one of them's a non-believer, how does that picture? And so Jesus is looking at her and, 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 and he's saying to his bride, you're not only my spouse, you're my sister. Now watch this. John 20, 17. Jesus has resurrected but hadn't ascended. Okay, there was a moment there where Mary Magdalene uh, comes to him in the garden, if you guys remember the story. And so what happens is she comes, she's fired up, she thinks the garden has stolen him and all that. And all of a sudden he shows up. And Jesus says to her, Touch me not, for I have not yet ascended. In other words, don't put your hands on me. i got to get up there holy. He goes... To my father's house. Now he's referring, Jesus is saying, I'm going to my father's house. But go tell, not my disciples, not my apostles, my brethren. Go tell my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father. I'm not real deep into genealogy, but if it's your father and he's my father too, then that makes us brothers or sisters. Okay, Which is why Jesus made sure that Song of Solomon was written in such a way that it pictures really what it is. Which is why it should be that way when you have a wife and a spouse, but yet my sister in Christ. Right? Now, I don't do that whole thing in church. Everybody... What was that, sis? Sis. sis. The, the pastors refer to their wives as that. Sis. And I'm like, nah, I'm not doing all that. I, that's, yeah, that's, that's, she's my sister in Christ, but that's my wife, okay? Now, let's look on here. He says, okay, how fair is thy love, my sister, my spouse? How much better is thy love than wine? Okay, and I've, I've, I've told you multiple times the word wine is connected to two things in the Bible. It's connected to blood, and it's connected to joy and praise. And he's saying, how much better is this love we have for each other better than joy and praise? Because it's not about a funny feeling, right? It's not about just having a... Listen, true love is love even in the worst of times. And if you're truly in love, that love will supersede or, or, or will ascend past all those bad times. Because if, if you're only going to have love for your spouse when the going's good, that's not love. That's not love at all. Okay. Now, notice here, the smell of thine ointments, then all thy spices... Okay, and I'll come back to that. Thy lips, O my spouse, drop as the honeycomb, honey and milk are under thy tongue. Now, honey and milk are both connected to what? The Word of God. Okay? And he looks at it and he says, your lips, what's under your tongue is what? The Word of God. The true believers the people who are walking with the lord what's in the heart proceeds out of the mouth that's why i never understood you know some of these guys that say they're preachers and i'm like really i 
I, listen, you, and people will freak out if you don't give them enough time to, well, hey, man, you gotta give me enough notice. If you're really walking and studying this book, you should be able to get up in less than five minutes notice. What's in your heart's going to come out of your mouth? This book is either in you or it's not in you. And if you, what if, what if God opened up a door for you to witness? Could you do it? Uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't know. I, I, I could get you or Justin on the phone. No, you're part of the bride. The milk and honey's got to be in you too, okay? Now, notice here, he says, and the smell of thy garment is like the smell of Lebanon, okay? So he had mentioned the smell of thy ointment, then all thy spices. The smell of thy garment is like the smell of Lebanon. And so he's talking about this fragrance, right? And fragrance is a unbelievable trigger of memory. It's just unbelievable how that's connected. And, and so every now and then we go out of town to do jobs. We don't do it very often, but when we do... Uh, you know, we obviously got to go out and stay out of town for a few days. Back in the day, my wife wouldn't go because we had little kids. Now, if we do it, she just goes with me. But back in the day, she would, if I left town, she would sleep on my side of the bed with my pillows. And I used to say, why? And she goes, because I can smell you. <laughs> well, for a dude, you're like, what's that mean? I, I stink, right? <laughs> And, and, and yet, that's the case. Listen, there are people who have lost their spouse and, and had to bury them, and they wouldn't clean out closets. Uh, they wouldn't change certain linens for a little while because they could still smell their spouse on those linens. Smell does an unbelievable thing, and it's unique to each human. And yet, that's what he's saying to you. Just the smell of you is just a sweet savor to me. Paul even talks about how we're supposed to be a sweet savor unto the Lord. All right, now, verse 12, he says, A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, and a fountain sealed. So he lists three analogies of what his bride is to him. And all three of them represent, even though there are three different imageries, they all give the same message, and the message is, she's not open. In other words, and by the way, notice a garden enclosed. Guys, we talk about how your wife is your garden, and you are a husbandman. Now, obviously, most of you have heard either Mark or myself or Justin teach on those things now understand that wasn't something mark had come up with on it like this would be a cool analogy and we you know that's waffle and spaghetti for those of you that don't know that he came up with now the deal is that whole garden thing is the image that god holds true to the to the bride throughout scripture and he says to her she's a garden enclosed in other words she's not for everybody she's for me She's a spring shut up. In other words, it's a flowing river, but it ain't for everybody. It's for me. And he goes on, he says, a fountain sealed. In other words, once again, if you can't understand it, she's not for you. She's for me. One of the reasons why God gets so upset with us that when we go back out to that world is it's spiritual adultery. And he's saying, no, 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 you're for me. You're mine. No different than every guy wouldn't, wouldn't really dig it with his wife going, yeah, I married you and that's cool because I wanted to get out of my parents' house, but I'm going to still go out here and do my thing. That's a lot of so-called salvation moments in the average American church now. I don't want to die and go to hell. I want out of the trouble I'm in. But I have no intention of giving you my life. I just want you to save the life I want. All right? And now, here, here it is. He's saying, she's closed off. She's mine. Now, notice here, Solomon, who just wrote that, gave you three analogies. He's the same dude who wrote Proverbs 15 and 20. He says, drink waters out of thy own cisterns and running waters out of thy own well. That's my well. Go drink your own well. And, and what he's also saying is, gentlemen, 
Be satisfied with your own well. Be satisfied with your own cisterns. And he's literally sitting here telling you what it's about. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad and rivers of water in the streets. Let them only be only thy own and not a stranger's with thee. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as the loving hind and a pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times. Isn't it interesting? That's the verse we started out with tonight. Like he's letting you know. I don't have it on the screen. Isn't it interesting? Jacob, who lived his life by the pleasures of the flesh, ends up getting married on a bad situation, right? You know who he married first? It was Leah. Okay? Leah. Then he marries her sister, Rachel. Then he's got two other women who were handmaids. When it came time for him to die... Who do you want to be buried by? Leah. The wife of his youth. Now, it's interesting. All right, now, now check this out. All right, now, Philippians 4.11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Taking this back to what he's saying. Let your own cistern satisfy you. Let your wife of your youth, let her breast satisfy thee at all times. Be content with what you got. It's interesting. Every now and then my wife will pull out this food for these 17 cats we own. And she can lay them out. They all got their own little bowl. And you know what they'll do? Look over there and go, oh, I want that bowl. And switch bowls. And then that one will go, I'm going over here to this bowl. Not knowing it's all the same bowl. It's the same stuff. But what they're saying is, I'm not content what I got, so I got to look over here and, oh, I think I, got, I think I want what he's got. Oh, no, no. I, I think I want to be married to her husband. And the reason being is because everybody thinks the grass is greener and God's saying, no, be satisfied with your own cistern. Then that way, the, the, the wife of your youth will satisfy you at all times. But it starts with being content. And whoever you married, you're married. And if your deal is like, well... I'm having second thoughts. Too late. Have those thoughts before you say I do. All right? Now, verse uh, 13. The plants of an orchard of pomegranates, pleasant fruits, campfire, spikener, spikener and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, and all the trees of frankincense, myrrh, aloe, and all the cheap spices. Now remember, he's comparing her to a garden, right? In verse 12, now he's coming down here in verse 13 and 14 and describing it. What's, what is an orchard? It's, it's a tree that produces fruit. The church is supposed to be producing fruit. I, who cares about a holly bush? What are you going to eat off of that? Like that thing's worthless in my opinion. I want something with some fruit on it. Right? Okay, Jesus is the same way. I want fruit. All right? Now, hang on, I'm going somewhere. You remember the story with John, uh, over there in John, Mary takes that spike nerd. We've talked about it multiple times already in this, this course on Song of Solomon. And she breaks that and the aroma fills the room. Do you want to bring a sweet, saving smell to your husband, the Lord Jesus? fruit that's what he's most impressed with bringing fruit ladies can you imagine constantly complaining about what your husband can give you if you were around some ladies and 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 a lady spoke up and she's like, well, I just, I need my husband to give me more money. I need to go more shopping and I hope he get, makes more money because I need more of this and I need more of that and I need more of this. Wouldn't you be like, whoa. 
Isn't that what most prayers are? God, I need this, I need that, I need this, I need that. You want to impress a husband? Give him fruit. A marriage shouldn't be about what you can get. It should be about what you can give. That's what it's about. Uh, one of the things that we do is we, we don't do these, like she doesn't have to beg me and go, hey, I really want to buy this. Is it all right? Go buy it. I don't care. Why? Because I love her and I want her to have what, you know, I, whatever she wants, go get it. Now, if you're in it together as a team, you know that's not a scary thought. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you something. So my wife gets pregnant with our first kid. We go to the ultrasound. I'm 22, 23, 24, 23. I'm 22 and I'm a punk. We go in, they're like, hey, it's a girl. I am torqued. I can't hide my emotions very well. I didn't speak to her for a day or two. This is a true story. I'm not saying I was right. I was an idiot. Okay? Go have a second kid. Same thing. I handled it a little bit better, but same thing. I'm like, dude. Third kid, she gets pregnant. And I'm like, you know what? We got a house full of girls. Let's just go girls, man. That, it'll make it easier. We don't need to add that into the mix. And so to this day, I can tell you exactly how the room was set up. I'm in there. They're doing the ultrasound. And they're like, oh, it's a boy. And she turns and looks at me. And her face has just got this huge smile like, I did it. <laughs> and, and, and I know what that is. is because what she wanted to do was please me and give me fruit. And guys, I, you know, obviously, it's a cool thing, no matter what kid you get. Girl, boy, it's not. But as a, as a guy, you want that male child to be able to take that seed and continue on your name. It's just, I, I think it's innate and given by God to be designed that way. And so, you, yes, it's a whole different scene. And yet, when that went down... She felt this sense of, okay, I finally gave him what he's been looking for. Not that I wasn't satisfied with the two other kids. It's just that moment was different than any other moment we've ever had. Now, it's the same thing, okay? Now, I want you to pay attention here. So he says, he starts listing all the stuff in her orchard, right? Hang with me. Campfire. The leaves and the young twigs. Uh, were ground into powder and mixed with paste and hot water. All right, Sa saffron. The stigmas are dried, pulverized, and pressed into cakes that are used for, many, uh, for making yellow medicines, uh, dyes in medicines and flavorings. Frankincense. Although many types of plants were used in incense, only one is mentioned in Scripture as frankincense. The Hebrew word for the plant is uh, labona, which means incense or freely burning. Oh, see if you can catch this. Ground into powder with hot water. Uh, pulverized here and freely burning. You and I go through trials and troubles. And the sweetest smell that can come before Jesus Christ is why we're going through the pulverizing of this world. Why we're being ground up and spit out. We continue to praise Him, keep the faith, walk with Him. That is the sweetest smell that we could ever give Him. Spurgeon said this, The man that God will use the most, He will break the most. Now none of us want to go through the trials. But in order to have that sweet smell of the sh saffron and the, the campfire and the frankincense, in order to get that aroma, you had to put it under pressure. You had to pulverize it. You had to beat on it. You had to put it in hot water. 
And yet, my life and your life, as soon as anything bad goes on, we're like, God, what are you doing? And yet, what he's trying to do is use the trials and the troubles of your life to bring a sweet, glorious smell to his nostril. And it just doesn't matter whether we want to deal with it or not. All right, look at this. Verse 15. A fountain, a garden, a well of living waters and streams from Lebanon. It kind of sounds like what we read earlier when he said, hey, that garden's closed, that one's mine. But now he's describing her. A fountain of gardens and wells of living water and streams from Lebanon. Okay, fountain, garden, well, stream. All right, John 7, 37. Jesus said, listen, if you drink of the water I give you, you're going to be like a what? Out of thy belly shall flow rivers of living water. And he goes on to say, it's the Holy Spirit of God is what he was referring to. And yet here we are. And he's like, listen, the church, if you want to impress the Lord, it's by walking in the Spirit. Right Now, we're going to change the narrative. This has been the whole time him speaking, but all of a sudden, on the last verse of the chapter, she speaks. Okay? Here's what she says. Awake, O north wind, and come thou south, blow upon my garden. In other words, she's picking up on what he's saying. You're my garden. He's, and she's like, you're absolutely right. I'm your garden. And I need the wind to blow on me. Now, what is the wind? The Holy Spirit. Remember Pentecost? It came as a mighty rushing wind. Okay, and she's saying, I need the Spirit of God to blow on me that the spices thereof may flow out. Let my beloved come into His garden. The, the biggest struggle we have in church today is getting church people to realize if you're truly born again, you don't have a life. It's his life. You checked your life in at Calvary to get this thing called salvation. And he didn't, he didn't die on a cross so that he could come and add to your existing life. He came so that you would die to yourself and give yourself over to him. And he wants to be the Lord and shot caller of your life. And yet, she gets it. This is your garden. I'm yours. Whatever you want from me, Lord. That I'm yours. And she's saying, come on in. All right? And he says, and let my beloved come into his garden and eat and his pleasant fruits. I just said this, that the greatest thing you can do for the Lord is to produce fruit. He is the most pleased by us when we're reaching and discipling. There's no other way of doing this. Now, Proverbs 31, 16. Isn't this interesting? The virtuous woman. <laughs> Solomon. <laughs> you, you, there's a lot of debate on who this virtuous woman is. Okay? But she's, she's obviously a picture of the church. I mean, that's the, her whole existence. She considers a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands, she planteth a vineyard. What is she trying to do? She's trying to impress her husband by planting a, a vineyard and giving him fruit. And she considers a field and goes there and buys it. Where's your field? I mean, you're saved. You're on your way to heaven, right? Okay, great. Where is your field that you're going to produce fruit for your husband? You got you to gotta find that field. You say, I, I don't know where mine is. I can't tell you where yours is. But there is a lot of field out there left. The fields are white, the harvest, the labors are few. Now, watch. All right? John 15, 16. He says, listen, you, haven't you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit that your fruit should remain. All right? That whosoever ye ask in the Father's name, uh, he may give it to you. All right, now, look. She says, blow up on my garden that he may eat his pleasant fruit. Now, isn't this interesting? I was just talking about the moment when we found out we were having a boy, right? And I was talking about Leah and Rachel. Now remember, the greatest desire of any wife should be, I want to produce fruit for my husband. 
Now, girls, when you were young and you saw some hot guy on television, you said you were going to marry him and what? Have his kid. Every, every woman does that. Oh my God, he's gorgeous. I want to have his baby. Okay? Why is that? Because it's an expression of love. It is what the woman can do for this guy. I can give you offspring. Literally, that's what this is about. Okay, so Leah gets married and she's not really loved real well, right? She's the sister with a good personality. And so she goes to the Lord and says, I need a child. And so God gives her a child, and so she immediately takes that child and is like, you see? That's why he says, and the Lord saw that uh, Leah was hated, and he opened up her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bare a son. She called his name Reuben, for she said, surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. The word Reuben means see a son. You can even get the picture. She gives birth, walks up to him and says, See, fruit, your son. Goes on and says, And she conceived again and uh, bare a son. And she said, Because the Lord hath heard that I was hated, and he therefore hath given me his son also. And she called his name Simeon. And she goes again and, and does Levi and Judah and says, Here they are. Because she's trying to win over her husband by giving him fruit. Well, the other sister gets word of this. And when Rachel saw this, this is uh, next chapter, uh, she, she uh, bare Jacob no children. Uh, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children or else I die. If you guys remember in 2020, I, when we were a COVID church out here in the gym, I preached a series on the eight barren women in the Bible and how seven of them overcome barrenness. And what we were preaching to our church was not all this physical birth over in that nursery. <laughs> it's working, but that's not what we were screaming. We were screaming, God Give us children, spiritual birth, or we're going to die as a church. And yet, this is what it's about. We should be wanting our husband to come into his garden and see his fruit and eat thereof. Now, now it changes narrative right back. Okay? It says, I have come into my garden. And my sister, my spouse, I have gathered my myrrh and my spices. I have eaten my honeycomb with honey, which is the word. I have drunk my wine with my milk, which is joy. And eat, O oh friends, drink, eat, yea, drink abundantly. I think Jesus said, I came to give you life and have it more abundantly. And he's trying to show you the abundance of their relationship between the two. Now it's interesting, Isaiah 55, 1 says, Ho, everyone that thirsts, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money can come ye, buy and eat, yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. It's, it's abundance. That's the way the, the marriage should be between Christ and His church, is it should be just flowing with abundance of joy and the Word of God and fruitfulness. Now, I'm showing you this because we're, we're about to show this and then we're going to get out of here. We are about to enter into the bride's troubled dream that starts in chapter 5, verse 2 and goes through chapter 6, verse 3. And so I want you to understand, we're changing narrative. He only spoke that one verse there in verse chapter 5, verse 1. But now we're switching it back over and I want you to see this. Don't, don't pack up on me just yet. Now watch. I'm just going to give you these verses and I'm going to kind of hit you with some stuff. Verse 2, I sleep, but my heart waketh. Now, how many of you guys have ever been dead asleep and woke up and went, <gasps> I mean, you, yeah, she does. It screams. <laughs> we, we've had some interesting middle of the night moments. <clears throat> Somebody's in the house. You know? And then you elevate as the, the man in the house going, okay, 
You know, you're, you're, you're trying to get your bearings because somebody's robbing us, according to her. They're in the garage. <laughs> it's one of the 17 cats. All right. So, but anyway, now I want you to notice it's the bride speaking. Who's the bride? The church. What is she doing? She's asleep. All right. My heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled, for my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of the night. So it's obviously nighttime. She's asleep. And Jesus is what? Knocking. Now, if you, if you know your Bible, you know where I'm heading. Okay? Now watch this. He's knocking on the door. Her answer's in verse 3. I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? In other words, I'm already in my PJs. I'm asleep in the bed. I'm not dressed. I'm not ready to get up and go do those things. Watch. I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? I can't get up out of bed. I've already taken a shower. I may get dirty. Now, now who are we talking about? The church. Who's asleep. And Jesus is knocking on the door and we're like, uh, 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 don't, don't, don't interrupt, Jesus. I'm in a very comfortable position. I've already taken off my clothes. I've already showered. I don't want to go get defiled. Hang on. My beloved put, for, put in his hand by the hole of the door and by the bowels were moved for him. In other words, down in her, her bowels is like saying gut feeling, right? Okay, now hang with me. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come unto him and will sup with him and he with me. Now, I want you to understand, for those of you who may not understand, there are seven church letters, seven church ages, and the last one is Laodicea. This verse is not a verse to walk somebody through a salvation experience. Who is he addressing? The church. The church is already saved. The first church, Ephesus, Jesus is in the midst of the golden candlesticks. You know what midst means? The center. The first church age, Jesus is in the center of the church. In the last church age, which is Laodicea, that's you and I, where's Jesus? On the outside going, hey guys, I, 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 I'd like to get in there, it seems to be cool. And we're like, oh, hold up, Jesus. We're already asleep. We're all just, listen, I'd get up, but I'm already clean. Most Baptists sit around and brag about how right we are and pure we are, and then we're not like all those people out there. And don't bring those people into this church. This is supposed to be, as you've heard a million times, a hospital not a hotel. It's a hospital for sick people. Well, if you bring them in there, then all our perfectness goes away. All our purity goes away. And I've watched that in this, not this building, that building over there, in the early days where we all had our suits on and we all just had everything pressed right and we were listening to just the right music and nobody would ever do any of those crazy things that they're doing out there. And we'd brag about it and then all of a sudden some visitor would come in. Oh my goodness. Did you see her? Did you see what she was wearing? Uh, she's lost. Well, we don't need that stuff in this church. No, we don't need you. If that's your attitude, we don't need you. Because the attitude should, should be, what, if i got to get dirty, I'll take another shower. That's fine. Jesus, if you're knocking, I'm getting up. I don't care if I already put my clothes on. 
You know, a few mo- a month or so ago, about 11 o'clock at night is when the hospital called with, with Beth and, the, and baby Judah. Now, what kind of pastor would I have been if I'd have said, ah, well, I'm sorry, I've already showered. I'm laying in bed. I don't even have any clothes on. I'll, I'll just have to wait till tomorrow. And you go, well, that would have been just extreme. But do you understand? That's what the church is doing. We're, we're asleep. Jesus is knocking. Romans 13, 11, And that, knowing the time that is now, is at high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than we, when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand, let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. He's literally saying, church, wake up! And I'm closing with this. I won't even go to the verse. You remember the uh, Jesus, the night he's betrayed, he, they go into the Garden of Gethsemane and he says, hey, you boys, you pray here, I'm, I'm going to go over here and pray. So he goes and prays for a while and he comes back, what are the boys doing? Sleeping, right? He's like, hey, 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 I told you, get up. Come on, can you not at least pray for an hour? Goes over, prays, comes back. What are they doing? Sleeping, all right? Same thing. He's like, hey, hey, get up. Let's pray. Goes over, prays again, comes back. The third time they're sleeping, you know what he says to them? Sleep on. Now, I want you to see this. So, I opened to my beloved. In other words, she finally woke up and decided, yeah, I might want to open the door to my beloved. But my beloved hath withdrawn himself. You guys go ahead and sleep on. I've tried to wake you up. I've tried to wake you up. You you just stay asleep. And you know, guys, Kelly Harbin, I, I consider this the greatest church on the planet. I have no other place on the planet that, I, that has my heart more than this place. But if you don't think we ain't laying to sins, you have a misunderstanding of Scripture. That same spirit of Laodicea is in this church is just as much as it ever is. And we sit around and we go, eh, no, I'm comfortable in the position I'm at. Let me just kind of chill right here until morning. And Jesus is going... Can I get in there? All right, I'm over time. So, all right, God bless you. We'll see you guys next week.